All right, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Megan Lowry. I am a media officer with the National Academy's um, Office of News and Public Information. Uh, thank you for joining us today for a webinar on the report that was released last week titled The Chemistry of Fires at the Wildland Urban Interface. You can now download a copy of the report and other supporting materials, including an interactive document um, at www.nap.edu, and we'll also chat that link out to you. Um, a recording of this webinar will be available on the National Academy's website in the coming weeks as well. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we are private nonprofit institutions that provide independent objective analysis and advice to the U.S. to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. For each requested study, panel members are chosen for their expertise and experience, and they serve pro bono to carry out the study statement of tasks. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the committee and must undergo external peer review before they're released, as did this report. Uh, before I introduce a few members of the committee that are joining us today, I'll just go over a few quick reminders. Um, this webinar is scheduled to last one hour, so we'll start out with a presentation, and then after the presentation is finished, we'll open it up to any questions that the audience may have. Um, to ask a question, just click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type it in. And you can ask a question and submit it at any time during the presentation. Um, all right, so now I'd like to introduce the members of the committee that wrote the report who are joining us today. Uh, we have Dave Allen, Chair of the Committee, and Melvin H. Gertz, Regents Professor of Chemical Engineering and the Director of the Center for Energy and Environmental Resources at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, we have Femi Adetona, Associate Professor in the College of Public Health at The Ohio State University. Uh, Amara Holder, Research Mechanical Engineer with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Research and Development. Fernando Rosario Ortiz, Professor of Environmental Engineering at the University of Colorado Boulder. And Barbara Turpin, Professor and Chair of the Department of Environmental Sciences and Engineering at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, and so with that, I will turn it over to the Chair, uh, Dr. Allen. Thank you, Megan. And Thanks for your interest in this report uh, that was released last week by the National Academies, The Chemistry of Fires at the Wildland Urban Interface. I'm gonna take about 15 or 20 minutes to give you a high level overview of the report, and then uh, we'll be available to answer your questions. So if we can go to the next slide. The study sponsors uh, were the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the NIEHS, the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, and then also there were internal academy funds provided uh, for this work. Next slide. As with all academy studies, uh, our study was guided by a statement of task, and we were responsive to that statement of task. The statement of tasks that we were given is reproduced here. I'm not gonna read this to you, uh, but we've highlighted in bold uh, a couple of key elements that will uh, guide the rest of the presentation. Uh, first, we were asked to describe chemistry information that would improve the mitigation of acute and long-term health effects associated with fires occurring at the Wildland Urban Interface, WUI, the Wildland Urban Interface, or WUI, as I'll likely be saying throughout the presentation. Uh, recognizing that there may be knowledge gaps, our statement of task also then directed us to uh, describe opportunities for research to fill key decision gaps or uh, critical information gaps that could aid decision makers that are charged with. Uh, addressing the impacts of wooey fires. So that was our statement of task. Next slide. We had a, a diverse roster of committee members uh, giving us multiple perspectives on wooey fires, ranging from the fuels that are combusted to the combustion conditions and the combustion chemistry to the transport and transformation of emissions and effluents from wooey fires in media to health effects. And so this is the group of volunteers who prepared this report. Uh, I'll, again, as I've done multiple times, express uh, my thanks to this great committee. It was a pleasure working with all of them to produce this report. Next slide. 
So let me then just jump in and summarize some of the main messages and recommendations from the report. And let's start with the next slide and the first message, which is that the extent of the wildland urban interface is increasing. The incidence of fires at the WUI is increasing. And uh, these uh, trends uh, are pervasive throughout the United States. Uh, there are some 40 million homes that exist at the wildland urban interface. And certainly one of the things I learned in this study uh, is that the wildland urban interface is not strictly a Western phenomenon. We hear a lot of coverage in the news about Western fires, which tend to be larger than fires in the East, but we have interfaces between vegetation and urban structures, residences throughout the United States. And what you see to the right is a mapping of some of these wooey fires. In the Western US, these tend to be interface communities. Uh, in other words, uh, an urban area abutting against large vegetated areas. In contrast, in the Eastern US, it tends to be intermixed wildland and urban areas. Nevertheless, those interfaces between the urban areas and the wildland areas exist throughout the US some 70,000 communities. And it's a very rapidly growing land type. And for a variety of reasons, the vulnerability is increasing due to climate change, due to uh, effects like drought and heat, due to fire and land management practices and other factors that are increasing uh, the extent and also the hazards associated with uh, wooey communities uh, to fires. Next slide. The other, another main message of the report is that wooey fires are different, different than wildland fires, different than urban fires, and those differences are multiple. So there are differences in the composition of the fuels. So uh, the mix of vegetation and urban structures gives us a unique contribution and composition of fuels that might burn when the interface between wildland and urban areas burn. In addition, there uh, are differences in fuel loadings, the amount of fuel uh, per acre or per square kilometer can be quite different in a wooey at that interface than it is in a wildland or that it is in uh, an urban area. The combustion conditions are different and the reasons for this are multiple, but let me give you a simple illustration of this by comparing the way in which a structure burns typically in an urban fire as opposed to a wooey fire. So in an urban fire, typically the ignition source is within the structure and the structure will essentially burn from the inside out uh, with resulting amounts of oxygen uh, to feed the fire available uh, with the resulting temperature and uh, volatilization of fuels. Uh, in contrast, a wooey fire uh, often is ignited from outside the structure. And so the structure burns from the outside in, and therefore the combustion characteristics can be dramatically different than strictly a structural fire. And so there are differences in combustion conditions that lead to differences in what the emissions are. So those differences in fuels, the fuel loadings, the combustion conditions lead to differences of emissions. Those differences in emissions then result in species uh, that undergo different chemistries as that fire plume can be transported hundreds to thousands of kilometers. And so the atmospheric transport and transformation is different. Uh, the uh, residues and effluents of the fire uh, are different, uh, resulting in quite different environmental chemistries 
and therefore exposures and health effects can be different. So the WUI is different in multiple ways than strictly a wildland fire or an urban fire. Next slide. Uh, main message of the report is that our direct knowledge of WUI fires and emissions and their health effects is largely based on extrapolations and inferences from what we know about wildland fires and what we know about urban fires. So we can project and infer what the chemistries might be, uh, what uh, the combustion conditions and emissions might be, but there is a paucity of direct data. Direct data that are available on the WUI are quite sparse. Uh, and that's because at what we're interested in to understand fires at the WUI is that interface, which by definition is a pretty restrictive area. Uh, it's the burning that's occurring right at that interface, not over the entire fire. So that makes the data scarce. It also makes the data hard to get because you need to be at those interfaces. And so uh, there are challenges associated with getting measurements of fires and their emissions at the wildland urban interface. But there are also opportunities. There are a great many advances in measurement science that have been made uh, in order to uh, miniaturize equipment and to achieve uh, other types of advances in measurements. And we have now new capabilities that can allow us to begin to collect measurements at uh, these interfaces, although it will be challenging. Next slide. So what the committee did was to identify major research needs throughout this system of going from sources of emissions to health impacts and to identify research needs and knowledge gaps that need to be filled in a variety of categories. So the categories that we identified and uh, listed research needs in included uh, the fuels and emissions, transport and transformation of those emissions and effluents, and then the exposure and health. We also identified the need for new measurements. Uh, and in each of these areas, uh, we noted that there was a need for fundamental measurements, for field and population studies, and for the development of new predictive tools. And so what we tried to do was to summarize these research needs at varying levels of detail throughout the report. One way we did this in the report summary uh, that hopefully many of you will read uh, was to create a table that I'll go to in just a minute uh, that had as its columns, these areas of research need, the fuels and emissions, the transport and transformation, exposure and health, the new measurements, uh, as well as rows that consisted of uh, these various categories of research, fundamental measurements, field and population studies, and the development of predicted tools. We also noted that this research should be coordinated. Uh, we need to develop stakeholder teams and research teams that will tie all of this information together, because after all, uh, what uh, gets emitted will influence what the atmospheric chemistry and the atmospheric transformations and the other transformations will be. Uh, those will affect the exposures and the health impacts. Uh, and uh, that in turn will determine who the at-risk communities are. So um, all of these research activities would be most useful if coordinated. So let's go to the next slide and uh, uh, identify uh, some of the near-term research priorities that uh, the committee identified. There is a table that appears in the main report uh, that lists all of those research needs in the categories that I identified, but the committee also recognized uh, 
that uh, we should identify what we regarded as a committee as high profile research needs. And we identified three. Uh, the first is to begin to better understand the chemical composition of the materials and structures at risk from woolly fire. So what are the things that might burn at the interface? And they can be highly varied. Communities vary uh, tremendously across the United States at the WUI. And what materials make up structures at the WUI, as well as the vegetation loading, varies dramatically from region to region. But this is the starting point. If we don't know what might be the fuel, then we're going to have a very hard time predicting what the emissions are uh, what the transport chemistry, uh, what the effluents might be, uh, what the exposures and health impacts might be. So uh, a key enabling set of activities would be to get much better definition on uh, the compositions of the potential fuels at Wui fires. Another thing that can be done quite readily and quite quickly uh, would be to add measurements of targeted wooey toxicants to air and water quality monitoring systems uh, throughout the country. And these may be permanent installations or they may be uh, deployable to areas that experience fires at the wildland urban uh, interface. But measuring what actually comes off of wooey fires will also bound our knowledge uh, or unbound the scope of much of the rest of the problem uh, about what might happen, what chemistries might be important if we can look at and identify what those wooey toxicants are. So the committee identified these two bookends of uh, research needs. Then finally, uh, we noted that much of the information about wooies as we went through our work was scattered and disconnected. And so there's a real need to facilitate uh, information transfer across all these diverse communities that can make contributions to a better understanding of wooey fires. And so uh, we also suggested as a high priority that uh, information repositories be established uh, to help the exchange of information. Next slide. So based on all that, the committee made two recommendations. Uh, one is that uh, uh, various agencies uh, associated with funding research should implement the multidisciplinary research agenda that is identified in the report. Um, and that agencies funding and the investigators doing the research should coordinate their research plans and activities and contribute to these repositories of information that will facilitate exchange of research information. A second thing uh, that, and a second recommendation is that as a part of these research activities, uh, the project should have deliverables that really address the needs of uh, actionable decision-making uh, for decision-makers working with the at-risk communities and vulnerable populations. We can make a lot of progress in research, but we also need to get information to decision-makers who are addressing uh, wooey fires on a day-to-day -day basis. And so uh, we also suggest that this be made a part of these research programs to develop these uh, uh, actionable activities uh, aimed at decision makers. Next slide. So there's a lot of detail in the report uh, and it's a fairly lengthy report, but the summary is a good overview of it. Uh, but there's a lot of detail in the report about specific areas and specific research needs. So that includes uh, the fuels, so the materials, the combustion, and the emissions associated with wooly fires, how they are transformed in the atmosphere, how they can wind up in uh, water and soil, what the human exposures and health impacts might be, uh, 
what some of the mitigation possibilities might be. And then finally, how do we go about improving our measurements? And so uh, that together with a final summary chapter in the summary, uh, which collects all that information provides a good overview of where the committee identified information gaps. Next slide. So if you want to get the report, uh, you can uh, click on these images. I'd once again like to thank the sponsors of the report and the committee for all their hard work on this. And at this point, uh, we'll open it up for questions. And uh, uh, again, the process will be that uh, you would enter any questions that you have in the Q&A. Uh, Megan will read those off. I'll uh, be the initial recipient of the questions that may redirect them uh, to committee members who are present here today who may have more expertise in the area than I do uh, of your question. So, uh, Megan. Do you have questions for us? I do, I do indeed. Um, thank you all for that presentation. Uh, our very first question today, um, I'm getting some feedback, I'm not sure. Okay, I think it's gone, thank you. Um, our first question today is, uh, what may be the differences in emissions between structure fires and buoy fires? Is it mainly a difference in scale and extent of burning with buoy fires being larger? So there can be multiple differences uh, associated with strictly structure fires and, uh, and wooey fires. And so, uh, and the differences between a structure fire and a wooey fire are gonna be a little bit more subtle than the differences between wildland fires and wooey fires. And so I think I'm interpreting the question properly is to emphasize these differences between uh, structure fires and wooey fires. And so I'll highlight one difference that goes back to uh, uh, things that I stated a little bit earlier. And then I'll turn to Amara, who uh, uh, was a principal uh, who has expertise in this area uh, and the differences in emissions. So uh, one of the things that I mentioned earlier as I was going through the slides is that the combustion conditions can be what, quite different. So typically in a structure fire, uh, your ignition source might be within the structure, and as a consequence, uh, the way that the fire will develop, and therefore the temperature history of the production of the emissions is going to uh, be dependent on the amount of available oxygen that you have inside that structure. In contrast, in a typical wooey fire, uh, you might have a lot more oxygen available in those initial phases of the, uh, of the structure burning, leading to quite different types of emission products from uh, the combustion. Amara, uh, do you have anything to add to that? Sure. Some other differences. Um, the oxygen content, I, I just want to say, is really critical here um, in a situation in a structure fire when the oxygen concentration is low that uh, skews the emission products into products of incomplete combustion. Uh, so you're going to have a lot more carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons and particulate matter being emitted under these conditions. When you're looking at a wooey fire where you might be burning from the outside in, the oxygen concentration may initially start up high, but then as the fire progresses in, inside the structure, you may see more of these structure fire conditions. Another major difference is that in structure fires, you might have only one or two rooms participate in the fire and the fire may be really burning through some of the interior furnishings. So it might be a couch or a cabinet or other interior furnishings that are really the fuel that's being burned there before the fire gets suppressed. Whereas in a wooey fire, you'll have participation of the entire structure itself. So it'll spread from uh, the wood framing of the fire into, inside and it will have the furnishings, the clothing, uh, chemicals, and different parts of the home might be included in the burn. So you'd have pesticides or paints and other compounds like that. You might even have fixtures uh, that are gonna be burned as well. So there's uh, some key differences there. And then one final difference that I'd like to touch on is the difference of 
the external environment. And so many of these buoy fires we found occurred during uh, high wind events. So you'd have some strong winds blowing that would be impacting the combustion conditions as well. And so that might also skew whether it's gonna be more of a flaming or smoldering or how much oxygen content is available uh, to uh, um, impact the emissions that are being produced. All right, thank you very much. Um, our next question is, uh, does the report offer any recommendations for what water utilities should do before and after a wooey fire? Uh, the report speaks to that quite extensively, and I'm just gonna turn to Fernando uh, on this one. The report covers uh, the information available on what are the potential risks to a water um, community water system after a wooey fire. Um, you know, we talked about some of the potential contamination issues with organic contaminants with metals. Um, beyond the scope of the report, there are other materials that are have been published already uh, by different um, groups that touch upon some of the things that utilities can do preemptively to be ready for this type of event. I will also stress that one of the, um, as Dave mentioned in his, in, in his remarks, one of the difficulties that we have is there's, there's still some data gaps that are, are out there and research needs associated with, for example, how long will some of these contamination events may be like, what will be the extent of the contamination? Um, some information that we will need to know before we can make uh, specific recommendations for utilities on how to safeguard their systems after, um, after a, a fire. Having said that, there's a lot that we do know, including the report and other materials. And uh, feel free to contact me if you have any further questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, our next question is, uh, have you looked into how invasive plant species can play a role in wooey fires? You know, the report uh, touches on, uh, on a variety of different types of fires and uses a number of different types of fires as examples. And wooey fires can be dramatically different in the type of vegetation that's burning. Uh, and just using two uh, examples that appear in the report, comparing, for example, the campfire in California uh, versus the Marshall Fire in Colorado, uh, which had very different types of vegetation associated with them. Uh, we note that, that they can be dramatically different. We did not specifically address invasive species and their uh, potential for, uh, for um, setting up wooey fires or increasing the hazard of wooey fires or changing the combustion chemistry. Okay, great, thank you. Um, was the committee able to determine if the health risks of firefighters operating in the wooey are similar to those when firefighters are fighting a traditional structure fire? And did the committee draw any conclusions about the need for respiratory protection in the wooey and what that protection would be? Yeah, so in a moment, I'll, return, I'll turn to Femi on this, uh, who's uh, directly uh, done work related to first responders. Uh, but we did uh, note these dramatic differences between uh, the practices of firefighters uh, in wildland fires versus uh, urban structural fires. And so the question came up, what do you do at the WUI? So Femi, do you want to address this? So I regarding difference in uh, health effects. I, I mean, what we found in the report is that um, most of the studies for uh, firefighters has been in association with acute exposure, acute health effects. But the, for the general population, it's uh, been more related with uh, exacerbation of symptoms of chronic diseases. So there's some differences regarding available information. With regards to um, respiratory protection, uh, we didn't conclude on recommendation of any uh, respiratory protection for wildland firefighters because there's, there's not enough data to do that. Great, thank you. 
Our next question is, um, does the report assess whether Louis fire smoke is more harmful than wildland fires? And did you find any evidence that one travels or stays in the atmosphere longer than the other? So two quite distinct questions, and I'll turn to Barb in a moment for the uh, residence time in the atmosphere and how things might change as you change uh, the emissions associated with Wui fires. It's a complicated question. Um, uh, but uh, certainly uh, we know that there are significant differences between the emissions associated with Wui fires and uh, the emissions associated with wildland fires. And two areas in which the report really emphasizes that difference are in um, halogen chemistry and in nitrogen chemistry. And I'll just give as a first example, the halogen chemistry focusing specifically on chlorine. And so, um, and, but the report is more extensive than the answer that I'll give to you here. So I urge you to read um, the chapters in the report dealing with the combustion chemistry as well as the atmospheric transport and transformation. But the, with structures, you can have substantial quantities of chlorine uh, that are present in the fuels. Just think of the plastic polyvinyl chloride, uh, which has substantial amounts of chlorine in it, uh, which will be uh, emitted in various chemical forms uh, as, uh, as the plastic is combusted. Uh, and so you have very different species that can result, uh, again, as Amara pointed out, depending on what the combustion conditions are, uh, but you could have chlorinated organic species of all sorts of types that get formed. Uh, once you have those chlorinated species in, uh, in the emissions, they'll have an influence uh, on the atmospheric chemistry as it goes downwind. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Barb to talk about some of that chemistry and then also some of the other phenomena that might change the, uh, the pattern of how far these wui related emissions will be transported downwind. Uh, you saved the hardest part for, for me, Dave. <laughs> I will say, I'll just back up a minute and say that one of the things I was surprised by when working in this committee was just how much plastic there is in, you know, um, urban areas and in, involved, you know, in, a, in houses and so on. And so, you know, I, I think that in the atmospheric community, we know a lot more about what happens in uh, wildfires uh, as the emissions leave the fire zone and move downwind and cross the continent even. Um, and we, and it's very, it could be very interesting to try to understand how the effects of more, a lot more um, partially decomposed plastic materials and um, metals and uh, the, you know, nitrogen species, how that affects the chemistry and how that alters the chemistry that you would get from a wildland fire. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think we know enough to conclude that the extent, that the extent of the plume is any different. Um, but we know that the composition, the compounds that form uh, in the atmosphere uh, through photochemistry, and um, multi-phase chemistry are probably different, right? And we don't really understand, um, you know, how big that effect or small that effect is, right? So the differences could affect uh, to what extent they, you know, what their life atmospheric lifetime is and whether they deposit through wet deposition or dry deposition where they end up and whether they affect water systems downwind, for example. And I think this, this question brings up a lot of things that are sort of pervasive throughout the report, that over multiple decades, we've learned a lot about structure fires. We've learned a lot about wildland fires. Uh, 
And now, uh, as we try and understand what's happening at the WUI, we're making inferences. So we can make inferences like, well, we know there's lots of plastic there. Uh, that's going to lead to halogen, potentially halogen radicals uh, present in the flame, as well as uh, influencing downwind atmospheric chemistry. Uh, but we're in making inferences, we're developing hypotheses, and there's uh, very few data against which we currently contest those hypotheses. So an example question would be, you know, are there compounds that are good markers of wooey fires or atmospheric formation products from wooey fires? And can you measure those in the atmosphere? And then how far away can you measure them, right? How, can, how far away can you tell that that was a wooey fire and not a wildfire? for example. Great, thank you both. Um, our next question is related, and I think you've touched on a little bit of it already, but um, you mentioned the wind in general plays an important role in wooey fires. So does wind result in more complete combustion and therefore less hazardous smoke in wooey fires? Well, wind will be important and will influence not only um, uh, the oxygen available, uh, but also then just the heat transfer uh, away from the fire. And so it, I don't think that there's a simple and universal answer uh, to the question about what the role of wind is. Clearly, some of the case study fires that were looked at um, were uh, fires that were driven by extremely high winds and the combustion was quite intense. Um, but often these winds are localized. And so uh, they may or may not influence the transport of, uh, of the result of, uh, of the emissions and the resultant uh, exposures hundreds or thousands of kilometers downwind. So, uh, so we expect that it's a, uh, a complicated uh, dependence on wind. Uh, so not a simple answer. And I'll invite any committee members who want to add anything to that to chime in. Any additional thoughts on that, Amara? Yeah, I'll just say it, at a localized level, we would expect that there may be quenching caused from strong winds as they would shear across uh, the combustion. So there might be uh, pockets of incomplete combustion where your flames are basically blown off of the fuel. And so I, I don't think it's as straightforward as it's gonna cause um, complete combustion we're safe. It's also gonna drive uh, fire spread. So it's gonna serve to um, drive these embers off the structure that's burning and spread the fire to the next structure over or the next structure over. So it's definitely a complicated um, process there with the wind and we do expect it to be one of the biggest factors in the combustion environment. Thank you. And continuing the same line of questioning, um, our next question is, you mentioned in the pre presentation that wooey and wildfires are different things, but it seems some wooey fires may start as wildfires, the campfire, for instance, which we've already discussed. Um, did you discuss on the panel how you draw the line between wooey and wildfires? Is a wildfire considered a wooey fire only when it starts burning structures or just by getting close enough? There is not a universally accepted definition of what constitutes the wildland urban interface. So as a working starting point, and this is all described in chapter two of the report, we used a definition that came out of the Federal Register and that uh, thereafter the Forest Service adopted uh, related to uh, the density of structures and the proximity of a large enough area of vegetation. But um, really uh, there isn't a universally accepted definition of what constitutes the wildland urban interface, but we use that operational definition as we begin to try and understand uh, things like, well, what are the uh, what are the um, fuels that are uh, that are present at the WUI, uh, getting a, a community research definition and an operational policy definition of what constitutes the WUI uh, 
would be very valuable. There, there are multiple definitions out there though. Uh, and uh, the one that appeared in the Federal Register originating back from around the year 2000 is what we use because it had been used by the Forest Service to uh, identify the extent of the WUI nationally in a number of subsequent uh, analyses. Great, thank you. And then one additional clarifying question. Um, when the report talks about the WUI, um, is it mainly specific to homes when you talk about structure fires or it also includes local businesses? Yeah, and I'll uh, start answering that question, but I imagine other committee members will have things to add to this as well. So our, our charge question particularly looked at residences, and you'll see, I think, the word residences in our statement of task. Uh, and also, a great many residences are, uh, are present at the wildland urban interface. Nevertheless, we're cognizant of the fact that you're going to have businesses, you're going to have a number of other types of, uh, of structures and operations, activities that occur at the WUI. And those can lead to uh, different types of fuels. We used as examples in the report, primarily residences, because it was uh, identified in our statement of task. Uh, and then uh, it's also residences are one of the dominant structural types. But uh, things like vehicles, for example, uh, particularly as vehicle types change, uh, introduce new types of materials that might become fuels at the WUI. Uh, anyone else want to add anything to that? I might just add that we, we recognize that there were other potential structures or facilities that might be involved in fires. A notable one would be like the Cerro Grande fire that was threatening a radioactive uh, storage facility, I believe, and then the car fire that was near a Superfund site. Um, we decided that it was out of our scope of statement of tasks to really address those in a comprehensive way, but we did note that uh, there are other areas um, and other facilities and structure types that may have very different um, concerns associated with them apart from the residences that we really focused on. But we did uh, look at some of our case study fires and some other fires uh, that have happened in the past few years and identified that really residences make up about 80% or more of the structures that are involved in, in a WUI fire. And so we're really capturing a large amount of the structures by just focusing on the residences in this report. All right, thank you very much. Um, were there any microbiological concerns identified with Louis fires, either public health or biogeochemistry? Um, I'm gonna turn to Fernando to see if he wants to address that in the context of public water systems. We, um, this falls, this, I thought about it, this falls beyond the scope of what we wanted to do, which was related to the more chemical aspects. Um, when it comes to microbiological aspects, there's obviously concerns with um, operations. Once you, for example, um, uh, maybe um, <clears throat> under conditions at which you're producing um, potable water that doesn't quite meet your target uh, 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 removal for turbidity, for example. But overall, this is not something that we consider in the report. All right, great, thank you for clarifying. Um, did the committee look at the extensive published data on structure fires toxicity from NIST, which was started in the early 70s because of the high number of deaths, which have now been greatly reduced using specific measures? We certainly looked at uh, literature that existed on a variety of different types of uh, both uh, uh, structure fires obtained in a variety of settings. Uh, Amara, do you want to add, do you want to address that uh, and what that section of the report described with respect to uh, what we know about structure fires? Sure. So we drew upon um, some of the uh, methodological work that's been done uh, to develop systems to identify um, smoke toxicity. And uh, we relied along, 
on much of that data to inform what we think might be emitted from uh, a WUI fire. So we're really talking about um, small scale tests like uh, cone calorimeters, uh, tube furnace methods that have been developed to um, go through the different phases that you might see in a structure fire. And we uh, pulled on that data to look at how the different oxygen conditions might impact the emissions to give us some bounds of what we might anticipate the emissions would be from an urban fire. So we, we certainly scour through the literature and we recognize that there's quite a lot of work that has been done in this area on um, structure fires and toxicity that was helpful for informing this report. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, um, why do you think the knowledge gaps that you point out in the report and in your presentation today are so numerous and what has kept more research or more findings from being concluded on buoy fires to date? So I'll highlight, uh, I'll highlight uh, two things uh, that, um, that the report emphasizes and then I'll go around and see if uh, other committee members want to uh, add their perspectives on why these uh, knowledge gaps persist. Uh, and so uh, one reason I think is the, um, is the rapid growth of the wildland urban interface as a land category and the number of residences and, uh, and other structures that are present at the WUI. So this is uh, a, um, a phenomenon that is uh, growing and growing very rapidly. So. Uh, it's, it's not an immediately new problem, but it is a newer problem. So that's one, one feature. I think in some ways, though, one of the bigger issues is that what you're really interested in is what's happening at the interface and getting measurements of what's going on at the interface is a really challenging problem. And doing that in the field uh, is... Uh, when you're also trying to protect human life and property uh, is a really challenging task. Uh, and so those are two reasons why I, I think there are lots of knowledge gaps. Do other committee members want to add things to that? No? Okay. I guess I would just say it, it takes agility, I think, to get that kind of data that, that you need, right? Because you don't know where the fire is going to be until the last minute. So you kind of have to be ready to go. And that means it's really useful to have, you know, maybe some inex variety of inexpensive sensors and some satellite data, but also mobile van, an airplane with real-time uh, instrumentation, so it, it's something that has to be planned and coordinated in advance. And, and then you've got to be ready to go where the fire is. So I, I don't think it's easy. But um, we've learned a lot in the last few years about wildfire um, chemistry. And, you know, that was also had the same problem. So I think it can be done. Although we we did note it at various points in the report that with wildfires, uh, you can take advantage of prescribed burns to go out and collect data where you can set up the logistics ahead of time and be ready to deploy advanced instrumentation uh, for a fire like that. And, and it's much less likely that something like that is going to happen uh, where structures are also involved. I'd just like to add on on the ambient monitoring side is that we, we really have focused on you know, our criteria pollutants, of course, they're important, but not chemical speciation measurements. So we really don't have an extensive network of uh, ambient monitoring that's just ongoing that could capture these and emissions and identify them as such. Um, so there, there are some gaps there. And as we start to have more speciated ambient monitoring networks, we may be better positioned to capture some of these emissions from the leaf fires. Great, thank you all. And um, your mention of prescribed burns is a good transition to our next question, which is, 
Um, are there any recommended proactive mitigation strategies for reducing the risks of buoy fires from your report? Yeah, and uh, I'm gonna, there, the main focus of the report and the statement of task was on the chemistry uh, associated with the fires and getting at the chemistry. But there were a number of points at which the, uh, the report did touch on, um, on mitigation measures. And some of those are to uh, mitigate the fires. And I'll turn to Amara in a moment and see if she wants to comment on some of the mitigation measures that were, uh, that were described in the report. But then also uh, one of the questions we touched on a bit earlier, and I'll just see if Femi wants to add anything to this, uh, is, uh, is mitigation of exposure uh, by use of uh, various types of protective equipment. So let me first turn to Amara and see uh, what she may want to summarize from what the report says about uh, mitigation measures in reducing uh, impacts of fires. So we, we reviewed the literature out there in this area to see what was being recommended. Of course, uh, there are multiple states and organizations that recommend different changes to building codes. California is a notable one and that they've been very active in changing their uh, requirements for building materials like moving to class A rated roofs and um, having double paned windows. Um, different types of changes that you could make to your structure to try and reduce its um, ability to ignite essentially. But there are also recommendations on the land management side, whether it be uh, clearing of materials. Of course, this is like your defensible space type um, regulations to try and reduce the amount of flammables around the home. Um, there's also recommendations for how to cluster communities and, and build them in a way that they have a buffer between them and wildlands like uh, a big water uh, space, you know, like a lake or park area that would be well watered and would prevent the spread of fire. So we, we tried to summarize the available information out there that's been put forth uh, as to mitigating fire spread into these areas and then limiting ignition in the buildings themselves. It's certainly an active area of research, but there has been a lot of focus on trying to reduce the threat of uh, fires in these areas. Uh, Emmy, any, uh, anything you want to add to what you said earlier about uh, mitigating exposures? So uh, for community members, uh, we, we touched on the use of uh, portable air purifiers, uh, having clean, clean rooms and clean spaces and uh, using N95 uh, respirators. Uh, for firefighters, uh, I mean, for outdoor workers, N95 respirators are a possibility, but for uh, firefighters, what might be uh, quickly applicable is uh, skin hygiene. So um, like I said before, there is, um, we don't have enough data to, uh, to touch on respiratory protection for wildland firefighters, but uh, skin hygiene might be one way that uh, exposure could be reduced and it's it's been shown in a couple of studies to uh, to have an effect. Great, thank you all for um, that information. Um, it looks like we probably have time for two or three more questions. Um, has there been any research on using rapid deployment drones fitted with passive or active sensors to characterize movie chemical emissions? Uh, so certainly uh, in the chapter of the report dealing with measurements, uh, we note uh, those as potential platforms for going out and uh, making measurements. Uh, I don't think we cite any studies where it's been particularly focused on WUIs, uh, but certainly that was recognized in the report as an advance in measurement technologies that has applicability to WUIs. Great, thank you. Um, which chapters, findings, or recommendations in your report do you think are most important for emergency planners, firefighters, others who are kind of the first to respond to buoy fires when they happen? 
you know, so, uh, and I'm not going to give you the chapter numbers because they kept changing and I'm, I'm prone to rattle off the wrong chapter number, but there's a chapter on exposures and toxicants in the fires that comes uh, just before the measurements chapter. And that's really going to be the section that talks most about health effects and uh, particularly to first responders and to communities, uh, as well as, uh, as various mitigation measures associated with those. So I would direct uh, readers to that chapter um, uh, that, uh, that deals with uh, exposures and toxicants. Great, thank you. Um, and can you talk a little bit more about the specific risks to certain groups of people or communities who may be particularly vulnerable to the impacts of Louis fires? I think you mentioned in the report, um, children, immunocompromised people, et cetera. Sure. So there are multiple uh, cases where there might be communities with uh, additional exposures or enhanced exposures to uh, WUI fires, as well as the emissions from other types of fires. And I'm gonna name a few, but then I'll ask uh, other committee members uh, to talk about this as well. And you can sort of go from the near field of the fire and the first responders and the communities nearby uh, to uh, further and further downwind. Uh, so among categories of people who are going to be more exposed are people who uh, need to work outside, so if you're not in the immediate fire region, uh, but for example, the campfire uh, in California uh, resulted in significant uh, levels of particulate matter in the atmosphere and other uh, emissions from the fire hundreds of kilometers downwind, including all the people uh, working outdoors in the Central Valley over uh, long distances downwind. Similarly, uh, uh, individuals who don't have the ability to, uh, to essentially close up their homes and prevent infiltration of, uh, of the pollutants from fires far downwind. Uh, people who don't have the ability to move away from uh, the impacts of the fires and have limited mobility. Um, people who are linguistically isolated uh, and may not get the messages uh, that are uh, broadcast about the, uh, about the risks associated with the fires. All of these could be communities that have enhanced risk associated uh, with uh, WUI fires. Uh, let me open it up more broadly to the, uh, to the committee and see if uh, they want to highlight uh, other communities that are identified uh, in the report. Well, I just generally like to say the report talks about um, that people, uh, communities may be vulnerable because they're exposed to higher concentrations of pollutants. And they also may be vulnerable because of their of underlying health risks that are exacerbated by the smoke, right? Um, and so, you know, those exposures sometimes come with their occupation or with um, um, their, you know, um, ability to their social or family support. So their ability to go move in with their another family member and get out of the way or their um, income, their ability to throw some money at the problem, right? And go go away and come back later. So there's both the health vulnerabilities and the exposures to consider in that question. And we talk about both of those. I think mostly in that chapter, uh, I don't wanna say the number now because I will also get it wrong, but on exposures and health effects. Great, thank you. And it looks like we have just about a minute left, but I'll just ask Dr. Allen if there are any last closing notes he wants to make or messages he wants to highlight from the report uh, before we wrap up. Well, I wanna thank all of you for your interest in the report. And then I'd also like to thank uh, once again, uh, the sponsors of the report, 
as well as all the committee members, both for uh, your participation today and then also for uh, putting together uh, this report. So uh, I think we're all proud of the result uh, and I hope uh, that you find the uh, report useful. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, again, I'll note that a recording of this session is going to be available on the National Academy's website in the weeks to come, so you can find it there. Um, once you exit this webinar, you'll be redirected to our report page uh, where you can download the report for free. Um, so with that, I'll again thank our speakers um, and thank you all for participating today.